Thanks very much. Thanks for having me, and thanks to the organizers. And yes, my title is Beyond Environmental Refugees. It sounds like bed, bath, and beyond. What lies beyond bed and bath? Who knows? Um, but the, pre the preceding talks sort of talked about how humans are pushing, uh, pushing the limits of what nature can do. And I guess my talk is sort of the opposite side of the coin, which is how nature puts limits on human behavior. And um, so environmental refugees is a phenomenon that I've been studying for a number of years. Uh, and it's also of interest to scientists, to policymakers, politicians, security and intelligence agencies, and, and maybe you've encountered it as well in the popular media. And what's happening right now is there's growing interest in this phenomena because I guess I should say what it is. An environmental refugee is someone who has to move from their home and migrate elsewhere uh, because of storms or droughts or floods or other environmental phenomena. And there's concern out there, particularly amongst the security and intelligence community, that as the impacts of climate change start to take hold, things like sea level rise, global warming, and things like that, um, more and more people are going to become environmental refugees in coming decades. And some of the predictions are really quite ominous. Uh, a few years ago, British ecologist Norman Myers suggested that by 2050, the middle part of this century, there could be 200 million people worldwide who fall into this category of environmental refugees. I've seen some predictions out there that suggest as many as a billion people. 10% of the human population by mid-century will be living in refugee-like situations because of the climate. Now, to put that into context, here on the map behind me, you'll see that there's actually about 12 to 13 million refugees worldwide right now who meet the definition given by the United Nations. That's somebody who has to flee their home because of persecution. So what these studies suggest is that there's going to be this multifold increase in the number of people living in refugee-like situations around the world. Now, um, I do not disagree with the idea that climate change is going to influence global migration patterns. Of course it will. It would be idiotic to think anything else. But I'm not quite so pessimistic about the way in which it will affect global migration patterns. And also, I think it's going to change the way or help us stimulate to a change in the way we think about migration. And I'll explain what I'm getting at here. There's about 215 million people right now who have migrated from one country to another. Uh, and probably many times that, people who have migrated but not crossed an international border, stayed within uh, their own uh, country. Maybe many of you have migrated to Ottawa to study or to work. And if you break down the world migrant population, you'll find there's sort of four reasons why people migrate. Uh, one is, well, they are forced to migrate in the case of refugees. Another one is people who migrate to look for economic opportunities or for work or jobs. Uh, some people who migrate to be with their families and others who migrate for lifestyle reasons or to, to go operate a ski lift at Whistler. And if you actually, there's a lot of Australians who do that. Uh, and if you actually look at these people and break them down, what you'll find is that the global migrant population consists primarily of people in the two middle categories, the people who are looking for work or opportunity and people who migrate to be with their families. And yet, and yet in, in sciences and in policymaking, we often focus on the much smaller category of the people who are forced to move. And we don't look at how climate and environment influences these big categories of people. And that's where my research increasingly tends to lie. So who are these people who are migrating right now across international borders? What you'll find is that with the exception of Mexico and Ukraine, most of these people come from Asia places from uh, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, China, the Philippines, Indonesia. I, forgive me if I've missed a, a country. And where are they going? They're going to countries like Canada, the United States, Germany, Russia, and Saudi Arabia. And you'll see on the map behind me, I've used happy faces to indicate the destinations. And that's deliberate because study after study has shown that over the long term, migration provides a net benefit. It provides a net benefit to the places that receive migrants. It provides a net benefit to the places that send migrants into the migrants themselves. This assumes, of course, that they're migrating voluntarily and not because they're refugees. Uh, but the point being is that the first thing we need to do is rethink migration. It's not something to be feared, not something to be controlled necessarily, but something to be thought of as how can we manage it to make it a more successful process for everybody involved. Now let's break it down at the individual or household level. What do people benefit? What are the gains that they get from migrating? Well, at the most elemental and fundamental level, people who experience a, a, a crisis in their family, it could be a health crisis, a financial crisis, could be an environmental crisis, sometimes migration is one of the ways by which they adapt to that crisis or cope with that crisis. 
Another way, and this doesn't happen so often here in Canada anymore, but in many parts of the world it still does, is people migrate to assure their basic household needs, their food security, their basic income. In some cases, they also migrate, like many of us, for economic benefit, uh, betterment, to get a better job, to buy a better house, to be able to afford to send their kids to university. And then there's another threshold where people migrate for social advancement. And so if these are the reasons why people are migrating, the question for us is, well, how is climate and climate change going to influence these sorts of motivations around the world? I'm going to give you a specific example to help you walk, walk you through this. In 1998, there was a big hurricane named Hurricane Mitch that plunked itself off the coast of Central America. It destroyed tens of thousands of homes, cost thousands of lives, injured many more, and destroyed livelihoods across whole countries. And what happened afterwards? In the weeks and months that followed, we saw a pulse of migration, not refugees, but job seekers, opportunity seekers, leaving the affected countries. So we saw Nicaraguan farm workers moving into Costa Rica to look for jobs. We saw people from Guatemala going to Belize to look for work. And we saw many Hondurans going to the United States to look for work because they already had social networks between those countries. And you can see this in immigration statistics. What I have up there on the screen here are uh, statistics from the U.S. Immigration Naturalization Service counting the number of Honduran nationals that they intercepted trying to enter the United States illegally across the Mexican border. And what they saw is that in the year after Hurricane Mitch, there was a big spike in the number of, of Hondurans trying to get into the United States. But they weren't refugees. They were young people looking to get a job in the United States. And why would they do that? Well, it's very elementary. They needed to get money to send back home so that their families could rebuild their homes, rebuild their livelihoods. So they were opportunity seekers. They weren't refugees. And so that's one of the reasons why we need to start rethinking about the relationship between humans and nature and why we migrate and why maybe we don't. And we have experience here in our country, too. You know, uh, in, in a living memory, we've had environmental refugees here in North America. During the 1930s, during the Great Depression, there were tremendous droughts right across from Texas all the way up to northern Alberta. Uh, and these caused tens of thousands of families to leave the prairies, to leave the Great Plains, to move to British Columbia, to move to California and other places. And they looked a lot like the people you see in the picture behind me. You see mom and dad and three kids, 1938, at the side of the road, they're making their way from Oklahoma to California. They're not refugees. They're looking for a job. They're looking to start again. They're not rolling over and just, you know, letting nature roll over them. They're seizing themselves by the bootstraps, pulling themselves up, and trying to start over again. And they had that opportunity. And so that is what we can look forward to in the future, I think, as climate change starts to have its influence on migration patterns. Now, to sort of wrap this up, the reality is this. We live here in Ottawa. We live in Canada. We're a very wealth, wealthy and prosperous society. And so when climate change hits us, we're probably not going to have to pick up and move homes and go somewhere else. But there will be people in other parts of the world who will be looking to Canada, to the United States, to other developed countries as potential places to start over again and try again. And should we, what should we be doing as people thinking ahead to this future? I'd say let's embrace it. If that's what's going to happen, then we need to start thinking about how we can make the migration process work for all of us. And this is what's in it for us. This family that I showed you, a young working family with kids, is the bedrock of every successful society on this planet. Without them, you don't have success, particularly here in Canada. We live in a society with very expensive social programs, medical programs, health care, pension plans, and that system depends upon having a continuous influx of young working families wanting to bring their kids into the system and self-replicate. And so we need to start thinking about these people are not refugees, and these people will not be people we need to control or keep out, but we should think about how do we welcome them within a global migrant community. This is a picture of an Oklahoman family in 1938. In 2028, this could be a Bangladeshi family. In 2038, it could be an Ethiopian family. I don't know. But the point being is that they are not to be feared. They are not refugees. And so one of the things I think is going to happen in coming years is that climate change, one of the unexpected byproducts of it, is going to force us to rethink how we think about other people and how we think about immigration, how we think about migration, 
We are a country of migrants, after all, here in Canada. And so I think this is one of the things as we go forward and as you go forward as the future policymakers uh, in this country that uh, don't treat this idea as something to be feared, but something to be planned for. And I'll leave it at that. Thanks for coming out.